You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, Somebody who I've become very close friends with, and I'm very lucky to call him a friend, but his story is one that a lot of people will relate to, and certainly one uh, that you may see on a national scale coming up here in the future. Just more on that in a moment. But first, our normal announcements. Follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch all of our Hazard Ground episodes as well. Download the Kill Cliff TV app because you can watch all of the Hazard Ground episodes on the Kill Cliff TV app as well. Speaking of Kill Cliff, our partners are friends. Make sure you guys check them out at killcliff.com. Get their CBD clean energy drinks. Killer Cliff Sickle, amazing. If you're into CBD, they have the best clean energy drinks with CBD on the market. I am a huge fan of their pre and post workout. Excuse me, as I uh, finish taking a sip of my Kill Cliff, but a, a huge fan of their pre and post workout drinks. So again, check them out at killcliff.com and you can get them shipped right to you wherever you are across America. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. Go to our website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the sponsors tab. Do all of your normal Amazon shopping. We get a percentage of what you guys spend. And then we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the great charities and organizations featured here on the Hazard Ground. And then finally, Apple Reviews. Continue to leave them for us. We're climbing up the top 100 list of Apple Podcasts, but we need more reviews to help us do that. Give us five stars. Tell us why you love the show. Wherever you get your podcasts, Give us a positive rating. We certainly love hearing from you guys, and we certainly love you being part of this Hazard Ground community. This week's guest, uh, again, somebody I'm very lucky to call a friend, but I, I ended up working with him through an organization called Merging Bets and Players. More on that in a moment. He spent four years in the Marine Corps, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. He is now the National Outreach Director of Merging Bets and Players, and his story has now become a movie titled MVP that had a private screening and maybe out in theater soon. He is Denver Morris joining us here on the Hazard Ground. Denver, welcome, brother, and great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it, man. Excited to be here. Excited to get this going, man. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's. I've been fortunate enough to have some people I've deployed with on the show, um, and it's weird. You and I never served together in combat, but we serve alongside each other right now, man. And it's like, you know, you're. I tell people all the time, like you're one of those guys that I would lay down in traffic for without a hesitation. You know, like it's just. We've developed that bond um, in what we do together and how we're helping veterans. And it's just, I'll get this out at the beginning, man. I love you, brother. And, and it's great to be working alongside with you. I'm so blessed to have met you and know your story. And I'm, I'm really, really happy that we're going to get a chance to tell it to everybody. Man, I'm so excited. This is exactly what I live for. This is why I do it. You know, just like you said, I'm building that relationship with you two, talking to you every single week, talking, working with the Atlanta area. It's just been amazing. So I appreciate it. And it's great. I mean, like, I mean, and veterans will understand this, right? Like you and I call to talk business about MVP because I work the Atlanta chapter here. Um, but usually the conversation always evolves into just you and I shooting the shit, right? Like it's just what's been going on, how you doing, has everything and what's what's overcoming our life. It's like our own little mini MVP session with each other each week. And I, I truly genuinely appreciate about that, about our not only our business relationship, but our friendship, man. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, we have to do it. We have to talk to each other. We got to see how each other's doing. I mean, a lot of times we're alone. We're in this this world by ourselves. So what are we going to do right now, especially with the whole COVID situation, everything? We got phone calls. So why not utilize, a, you know, enjoy conversations, not just talk about work, talk about life, too. All right, let's hit the rewind button. Take me back to young Denver Morris and how he got in the Marine Corps. Young Denver Morris. Wow. Um, so... Young Denver Morris was a little shithead. Um, that's the best way of saying it, right? Uh, so uh, young Denver Morris, he was, uh, you know, he went through a lot growing up. Mom was only 17 with two kids. Um, growing up in a town called Santa Maria, Orchid, California. Uh, we were just basically living. Uh, both parents worked at a grocery store and we basically were just surviving. I was playing football growing up. I was doing what I had to do. So I already had that camaraderie when it came to, you know, sports. So 
for me, I kept getting in trouble in high school. I got, you know, started doing the weed, got kicked out of school, did this, did that, got straight F's in uh, sophomore school. But uh, it was honestly when my grandpa was passing away, he was passing away to cancer. And uh, I remember walking up to his bed, just got back from a, a church retreat. And he said, Tiger, and he used to call me Tiger. And he said, Tiger, if you want to treat a woman with respect and what you want to do in life, you're going to join the Marine Corps. I was in the army, but I want you to join the Marine Corps because this is what you will do. You will learn how to treat a woman with respect. This is what you need to do. So for me, I knew seventh grade, I knew I was going to go into the Marine Corps. I knew that that's all I wanted to do. So I didn't care when it came to high school. I didn't care about anything. I knew what I was going to do. Um, so for me, that was my big part is, is getting into that, doing it for my grandpa, doing it for the family and knowing that I'd be one of the first, my generation going into the military. So when 9-11 kicks off, I mean, clearly you're in seventh grade before 9-11. Any of that sort of deter you? Any of that sort of even I, even your mom, as young as she was, say, hey, Denver, I don't want you to do this kind of deal. I, you know, what's funny is she actually was saying, I want you to go in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come high school, she was like, where's the dotted line? Can I sign? Um, believe it or not, she was, you know, it was it was one of those things that I think in the family and and my my dad, my uh, my mom, my all my grandpas were in the military, right? World War II, this and that, and they saw what it did with them. So they wanted they wanted me to go in. I mean, seventeen years old, I was laying in bed till three o'clock in the afternoon, not doing anything with my life, just sitting there, and I was just getting in trouble, kind of thing. So they just were like, "Are you going down to the recruiter's office today? Are you going to go? Are you doing this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, no, I wasn't going." But, you know, 17 and a half, I finally actually went and did it. So, yeah. When you, uh, since you had known you were going to be a Marine for a while, that's what you're going to do. When you had gotten to boot camp, did you, were you the kind of guy who studied up on it ahead of time? Or did you just kind of go into it blind and said, I'll figure it out when I get there? I went in, uh, I'll figure it out when I get in there. And it really was not the best thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> that was not ready, man. <laughs> that's the best what was the culture shock like? Um, honestly, I didn't realize how much I was going to miss my family, uh, not realizing that I wouldn't get a phone, wouldn't get a phone call, wouldn't do this, wouldn't do that. And walking into boot camp, you're, I knew that I wanted to be infantry. I knew that I wanted to go fight. I wanted to go train, but I was so scared. I, I didn't know. Uh, why is this person screaming at me? I'm over there. Like, I thought my mom's screams or, or like yelling at me was scary. Nah, these guys jumping in your face. That was the scary part. <laughs> Uh, did you not think you were going to survive boot camp? You know, I had a difficult time with drill. Um, so, but once I got out into the field, so in, in Marine Corps boot camp, you do one month drill, one one month of out in the field, and then one month doing drill again, right? I did horrible on the drill. I did not like the structure lifestyle, if you will, right? So drilling, all that kind of stuff just wasn't for me. So, um but when I was out in the field, that's when I thrived. That's when I could actually take control, when I could actually grab these individuals and lead them too. So uh, for me, it was infantry, you know, this and that. But I didn't think I was going to survive holding a rifle and, you know, doing drill. I, that's not what I signed up for the Marine Corps to do, was going and doing drill. <laughs> right. When you graduate boot camp, where are you headed? So uh, when I graduated boot camp, uh, they told us a week prior, uh, I had to, you know, take 10 days off, of course, mm -hmm. uh, for our little leave. I went back home for 10 days and then I came back to Camp Pendleton. I actually got stuck in Camp Pendleton for three months um, doing guard, which we were the longest, you know, boot, boot, boot drop that uh, got set there. Right. Um, so we got stuck in there. We were in guard, went to SOI. And then in SOI, they actually said that I was going to get with 2-7, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines. Um, I had no idea, honestly, what that even meant, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, I had no idea. I just remember getting on the bus and driving to 29 Palms from Camp Pendleton, and I thought I was in prison, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, why? Um, you know, this, who I replaced was uh, a unit that literally was – one of the most deployed units in the Marine uh -huh. Corps. Yeah. Um, and when we pulled up, I, all I can remember literally is every senior, single of my senior Marines were out there. 
And all you hear is fresh meat, fresh meat, fresh meat everywhere. <laughs> I'm shaking. I'm like, what is going on? I mean, I think I stayed three nights up, you know, that whole hazing situation. I don't want to get too sudden in trouble or anything, but, <laughs> um, you know, it was, uh, I thought I was in prison. It was a uh, scary. I actually got put with the uh, unit or my, my platoon, my squad, everything. I got put with, uh, they lost 10 guys literally right. right before I got into that unit. So they were already angry. They were already upset. They were pissed off. They wanted to see literally what I had, how I could be trusted. So what did that lead to when you got now, what month and year do you get there? April, I want to say April, 2006. Okay. So you got like what a year before you deployed with them? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. I so, had a whole year at that point in time, they want you to sort of prove your metal and your worth to them. Uh, you, you're fresh out of basic and, and SOI school of infantry. Uh, do you have any idea what you're about to walk into? No, I had no idea for that whole year. Uh, until you deploy in an infantry unit, you actually get treated like a boot. You are chopped liver. You're, you don't get to go hang out with the senior Marines. You don't get to do a lot of stuff. Right. So for me, it was a whole year of trying to prove, trying to prove, but then I wasn't doing too good. I didn't know how to thrive in that kind of setting. So for me, it was hard for me to get in there, get with the, the group of people. Now, mind you, I was also trying to figure out friendships. I was trying to figure out, I'm 18, year, 19, 18 years old, right? So what am I doing at 18 years old? You're still trying to figure out everything, but then taking you away from your livelihood, your home base kind of thing. So for me, it was difficult. I also lost a guy in that year to him drinking himself and he actually passed away. Uh, he passed away in my arms to drink, you know, over drinking. He drank basically a, a gallon of, of Captain Morgan in an hour and a half, basically. Um, okay. you know, and that was in my hometown. So he actually went home with me. I was going home every single weekend because I didn't want to stay in 29 Palms. Nobody does, you know? So right. during that year, that's a big reason why I actually couldn't, do very well is because losing that guy um i got blamed for his death they, they were saying that i killed him this and that which you know i i wasn't there for it so um unfortunately that's what i ended up having to work with for that first year that i was in the marine corps was was the guy who killed himself another marine as well or okay yeah, he was in, he was another marine he uh he actually graduated boot camp he was a part of my boot drop and he actually graduated he was the uh squad leader basically um, so the one that actually carries the flag in, in, at the boot camp. So he was, uh, you know, the, the Marine that everybody was looking up to kind of thing. Did anybody um, check in on you at that point in time and ask you how you were doing? Or as you uh, said, you're just getting more blame for it. Oh, I just got blamed. Literally, I got back. Um, I remember it was in Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. We dropped him off. I had to leave at 2 a.m. because I had to go to back to formation the next morning. Right. And I mean. People were waiting for me in the catwalk. They were waiting for me. They were just angry. They were mad. Everybody already knew, basically. I couldn't see driving home, you know, because I was so tired, so tired from crying and exhausted. I was with four other guys, too. Okay. You know, and so we all went back. Um, I mean, it was hard. It was a difficult time for, I think, the whole unit for everybody. It was it was such an impact for everybody. Now, did this guy, so he didn't go deploy with those guys before you got in there, right? So, okay. no. so there yeah. wasn't that sort of personal connection. Not that I'm trying to minimize it, obviously, but there wasn't that personal connection with all those old guys who had, had literally had battle scars on them. Okay. Exactly. So you're getting, you're getting over this, trying to figure out how to fit in. Um, with all this going on, did you think you made a mistake joining the Marines? Yeah, actually, um, very much. That was a scary moment for myself. It was why did I do this? What am I doing? I just want to go home. There were so many times I thought about walking away and this and that, but then every time I'd walk away, my roommate or my roommates would sit there and say, no, 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 you're good, man. We got you. Just deal with this for a little bit. I mean, I had a detective call me, for instance, and say, did you kill him? <laughs> right. And it was like, what are, what are we doing right now? Wow. Um, so that also at 18 years old, you don't know what you're doing. You don't, you don't understand it. Right. And I didn't thrive. Like I said, in boot camp, I didn't thrive in drill. I didn't thrive in formation. I didn't thrive in all that kind of things, but then under chaos, that's where I thrived at, you know, just like a football, when I was growing up playing football, it was, 
I go in, I was a quarterback leader, right? I was a quarterback growing up and I didn't thrive at practice. I thrived during a game. I thrived when shit was hitting the fan. It was like, let's go, let's go. That's when I thrived. That's when I did good. You know, going into the Marine Corps, it was one of those things that first year I didn't really thrive. And then once I got to Iraq, that's when everybody sat there and was like, wow, this is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, I mean, here it is. <laughs> So when do you find out you're, you're leaving for Iraq? Because then you got there April 2006, you, you deploy in 2007. What do, you, yeah. when, what do you hear as far as the, the lead up? You know, everybody was saying that they weren't going to deploy us anymore. They weren't, they weren't. And then all of a sudden, I really can't remember the date, to be honest with you, but I just remember pulled the whole battalion in and they said that we were going to Iraq. I want to say six months prior or so before leaving. Right. I think that was a hard part too, is being a boot for a year, uh, being somebody that they, you know, you're walking in there basically and being treated like crap, but then not knowing if you're even going to deploy too. going into an infantry battalion and not knowing if you're going to deploy. So you're also screwing off. You don't know what you're doing. You're going to the ranges, you're doing this, you know, and so on. But uh, I remember, I think I was at range 400 and they told us about it. So. So are you excited when you hear about it or is there like a, a apprehension, nervousness sort of fear? Overcome? I was so excited. I was so pumped. I think uh, that was one of the, the best nights of in the barracks was us all celebrating and just hanging out. And it was like, this is what I'm working towards. This is, it's almost like the Super Bowl, if you will, right? As a Marine Corps infantry guy, it's almost like getting into the Super Bowl. You're like, yes, I'm doing it. All the three, uh, Three-time pump guys, they were all wanting to not go out because that was the rule of thumb is your third pump, you're done. So that was a big part is we were all looking after them. People are trying to get out of the Marine Corps now at that point. For us, I was excited. I just wanted to be there and see what everybody else was talking about. <laughs> um, and 2007 for Iraq is the surge, obviously. So there was a lot going on. When you get there, where are you going and what do you know of your mission? You know, it was hearts and minds at that time. 2007 was hearts and minds. It was, um, I, I flew in Kyrgyzstan, went into went Fallujah, and then we pushed out on Mobile One and we went to Sacloia. Sacloia, yes, Sacloia. Um, it was a huge hotel, Fabra Vieira. That's what it was called. And pull up, and I'm like, this doesn't look like a rag. This is nice, you know, like, cool, awesome. But honestly, uh, Staff Sergeant Navai, he was uh, one of my big mentors in the Marine Corps. Uh, he was our platoon sergeant. I'll never forget it. He sat there. And when we got off the plane in Fallujah, he puts on all of his gears. And mind you, I'm a boot. I don't know what the hell's going on. He's like, all right, strap up, boys. Strap up, strap up. And he starts running off the plane. I'll never forget it. And he acts like we all got to take cover, even though we were in the same spot. <laughs> so we're all strapped up we're all we have our, our m16s racked back everything and he's just like take cover i'm like dude really bro and he starts just cracking up laughing at us so for me it was scary walking in there but then all my senior marines they were like no we're good we're good i got you um so uh going over to sacloia that was our our mission was literally grabbing our beef raviolis out of our our packages and go giving them give them to the iraqi nationals uh, we stood a lot of posts. We, we worked at the IP station, the Iraqi police station. We uh, had to stand post with the Iraqi police. We stood post with uh, civilians, even the civilian uh, population. We were going around. We had to actually take uh, fingerprints at that time, get everybody signed up, get everybody. You know, it was a lot of uh, calmness. Um, we did get a, a puck, a presidential unit citation in Iraq. Uh, we did actually... Uh, closed down the city at one point um the city that we were in we we got a sniper he got one of our guys um, at the iraqi police station and then so we got hit pretty hard on 420 we got hit for it really hard actually um one of the bridges 287 it got blown up a couple of our guys got hit pretty bad we got one guy that's that's still not doing too good um i still talk to a lot of those guys but um you know we closed down the city and literally we closed it down for two months. Nobody was allowed in the city. Nobody was allowed out of the city. 
And we started going around kicking in doors, checking on people. But that was our mission right there was to make sure that nothing happened in that city anymore. When do you get a sense that, you know, that your metal is tested and you've proven it? I mean, was there a certain situation where you guys were in contact or is it just, you know, you don't really get that realization until you have to get out of there? You know, it was, it was more of, so I was on QRF when one of the, the bridges got hit, mm-hmm. when the bridge got hit. I think that was the moment that I literally was like, whoa, where am I at? Um, first couple of days that I was over on patrol, we, we started getting complacent, to be honest with you. It was, it was kind of boring sometimes. It was like, oh, what are we doing? But then every time that we got bored, so we only really had a sniper threat out in Iraq. We didn't really take any small arms. We didn't take any RPGs really for the most part. But I think uh, that was when it was just one of those, like, what am I doing here? Uh, calling my mom. I think this was the moment was talking to my mom and mind you 12 hour difference when you're calling and it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm like, hi. And then all you hear is boom. So then you got to hang up the phone and throw the phone kind of thing. And my mom's two weeks later, like, is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, everything's good. Don't worry about it. Like, you know, we're good. So um, Iraq was a little bit more calm uh, than Afghanistan itself. Do you understand, you know, you talk about being a 19 year old kid, Guys get hit and you lose guys. Do you understand what that means at that point in time? I didn't, I didn't really understand it, man, to be honest with you. It was one of those, um, like, what is this? Why? Why? But then you also start thinking about your faith. You start thinking about a lot of different things. And it's like, why does this happen to me? Why at this age does this happen to me? Why this? Why that? And I think that's a lot of it was sitting back and saying, why, what is going on? Who is, why that person? Why that? Um, I think that was what it was. Did you see any of your, your other Marines sort of react negatively? Did they start getting scared? Did they start, I mean, any of these conversations sort of happen and materialize? Not really. I mean, I think it was so, we didn't understand maybe like PTS and we didn't understand any of that kind of stuff at that time. Right. It wasn't really being talked about. It wasn't really out there. Right. Um, so <clears throat> we just kept having to get up, push on, move forward and, and forget about the day before. Almost. Let me ask you a hypothetical, knowing what you know now, and especially given what you do with merging vets and players, even though the conversation could have been had back then, do you believe that if somebody had the fortitude to bring the conversation up to Marines at that point in time, like there would even have been the stomach for it within the Marine mentality at that point? I, I think that's a hard one, right? Because I do sit back and I do think about when we're in that time of war, right? And we're in that time, do we want to sit there? And this is, and I love this actually, because I've thought about this quite a bit is I don't know if I want my mind to go into that right. other way, right? right? So I want to almost keep pushing forward because now it's not me doing it for myself i'm not trying to survive for myself i'm kind of trying to survive for others right so if somebody were to sit down and say hey we got a therapist we got this for you we got that i don't think i would want it at that time i think i'd want to keep paying attention to the mission now if we weren't at war for instance you know and kind of downtime but then i also as a marine veteran right i also don't want to get weak i want to keep my mind straight and kind of get it forward no, I mean, I, I told, listen, when you unpack that box, it's messy, right? And, it, and it's not something that once you start unpacking, you can just stop and leave a mess. It's yep. almost like everybody has OCD in that sense when you start unpacking all the PTSD stuff, right? Yep. You have to have OCD on it. You have to put it all back in an order. And otherwise, you've only made a mess more of a mess. Yep. So I, I totally understand because I probably would have been the same. I, I, would, I would have reacted, guys, there's time to deal with this later. You know, like yep. we, we can't do this right now because it's going to detract from us staying alive. Yeah, correct. Uh, correct. You know, and so, yeah, I, I think that because we, we talk about a lot on the show, like, you know, in retrospect, do you think you should have taken a knee in retrospect? Do you think you should have, you know, talked to somebody? Everybody says, yes, 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 yes. But uh, you know, you put it in the, in the frame of, is it practical to do so? Or is it even um, pragmatic to do so? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, don't, I, I, I honestly, don't know it is. Yeah. it's hard because you, you, you can't get distracted. Right. And those four years that I was in, if I would have got distracted, I probably wanted to deploy to Afghanistan, for instance. I probably wanted to have been able to get there. When we, I got back from Iraq, it was don't talk to anybody. Don't talk to anybody. I'm actually kind of happy I didn't, right? 
Now, when I got out of the military, that's when I did need to talk to somebody, right? So that's my two cents on it myself is just during that four years, it's, you just got to do, you got to put your head down almost and, and do what you got to do. Right. So, right. and especially in the, the rank that I got out, all that kind of stuff, I really wasn't high up there too. I didn't get those vacations. I was still doing working parties. I was still doing all that little stuff. So I wasn't, and if I would have gone and seen a therapist, if I would have gone and seen somebody to go talk to, they probably would have judged me as well too. Right. So mm -hmm. now does that put me into a leadership role or does that put me into somebody that's still dealing with something or little kid stuff. Right. Right. Uh, how does that deployment, that first deployment to Iraq end? I mean, you know, I know you'd mentioned guys got injured, guys got hurt, but everybody else, you know, you come back relatively unscathed. Yeah. I mean, we came back and I mean, it was just go do what you got to do. We didn't know what was going to end up happening. I took my 30 day, you know, leave and did what I had to do. Went back home, hung out with the family was that? No. Yeah. So I went and hung out with the family and then literally it's just, we waited, we waited, we waited. And then we got back from our leave. And I mean, they just sat there first month. They were just like, all right, guys, you guys deploying to Afghanistan. I mean, the uh, cheers for that. I felt like, so full metal jackets actually with two seven and it's about my company that I was in two right. seven is. I remember being on the football field in 29 Palms and Sergeant Major Barrett came out and he actually announced that we were going to, to Afghanistan. I mean, the cheers, the screaming, the everything. I mean, we were jumping up and down. I swear, I thought it was a, a baby reveal or something like that. It was like, everybody was so pumped when, up. When you look back on that, does that seem silly? It, it does. <laughs> But I mean, even now, like, I'm like thinking in my head, like if I got news that I was going back, I'd be like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, you know, it, it, it sounds silly, but then it's like the ones that didn't get to deploy with us, that got the word that they were deploying, did all the work up with us, but then didn't deploy. Their faces were so sad that they didn't get to do, right. you know, because now mind you, my unit, they went to Iraq, Iraq, Iraq right mm -hmm. then you come out and you say afghanistan and it's like whoa afghanistan now we get to go have some fun kind of thing right now mind you fun's not probably the right word but you get where i'm at <laughs> no I, and i remember too i mean you'd say fun is not the right word there was a time like 2008 2009 you know afghanistan was kind of forgotten about like in reality it was almost safer in certain places and in, in certain aspects than iraq was because you know while there are IEDs in Afghanistan, not to the level that there were in Iraq, not at all. Um, no, it's actually crazy. That was what our threat was in Afghanistan. That was right. actually, so we, so my deployment to Afghanistan, we sat there, we deployed, we were the first Marine unit back over to Afghanistan, actually. Um, right. So we, we had no idea what to expect. I mean, we had a 236 bit, bit convoy, for instance, that was dropping off companies on the way down. And I mean, we were so scared. I'm talking about during that convoy, that was probably the dumbest convoy that you could ever do, but we needed Vicks into these areas. <laughs> but um, when we were in Kandahar, we sat there for two and a half months, sat there for two and a half months because we couldn't, we were still trying to get all everything set up for that deployment, right? So we didn't know what to the right, to the left, we were waiting daily, right? to just sit there and drop us off. I mean, we got hit by IEDs, IEDs, IEDs that whole entire way. And all we could do during that convoy is pass by those, those Vicks and just say, sorry guys, but we got to keep pushing. Wow. I mean, that's just so counter to what <laughs> we're trained to do period. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was a saw gunner in Afghanistan, um, little 125 pound dude. And I was a saw gunner. So in the, I was actually the gunner inside the the humvee little tiny dude man like i still don't understand why they gave me the saw of all freaking people punishment you know, you know but i'm like dude there's 250 pound dude he can carry all this weight <laughs> um but i mean i was up in the in as a gunner i had the headset on i was talking to everybody i was talking to the um to the driver i was you know a cell phone for instance we were afraid of cell phones we were yeah. 
Uh, we didn't know just because we were the first Marine unit back over there. I mean, the cool part was when we went to where I was at, I was in Moose Kayla in the Hellman province. Um, and we already had the British Army there. So we already had a base set up for us, right? So for me, it was actually pretty decent to jump over there and set up. We, we had to set up a tent. We set up all that kind of stuff. But the city was already still kind of okay, if you will. Take me through a tick in Iraq versus a tick in Afghanistan for you. Uh, I mean, I think the one, one day that, you know, Iraq that I talked about with the, the blast, for instance, 287, bridge, right. you know, and I think that was the one day. Uh, the other one was Afghanistan. I think it was, you know, Casper, Posner and so on. They got hit. Um, we were on patrol. And mind you, we could hear the ICOM chatter. We could hear the chatter from the Afghan nationals, right? And they called us tanks. They called the VIX tanks, right? And we heard them saying, they're coming, they're coming, let's, let's hit them, let's hit them. And I remember physically seeing this mortar just drop right on top of them. And all I could start screaming was, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone, right? But I think physically seeing it and physically watching it all happen as I was in the gunner seat and then watching this just drop and not knowing what the, what just happened. I mean, I remember the, the medivac, it came up, loaded them up. And all I wanted to do was go and follow that, you know, but we couldn't. That medivac took off by itself, right? So we had no idea. Are they dead? Are they alive? This and that. Luckily, both of them survived, right? However, knowing that you can watch and see something like that and not knowing to, if they're okay at the end of the day, I think that was probably one of the hardest parts. And then, like I said, Afghanistan was a lot different. It was harder uh, because you hear the booms, you see it. Um, and Iraq, it was, we were in a hotel, for instance. So when explosions would go off, you felt a little bit safer. For us in Afghanistan, you hear a boom, we had no protection around us, nothing. We had nothing. So you're not sure if they're good, if they're happy. It was strange because Afghanistan, we would go on eight hour patrols or so, and we would go a click to the north and we'd get hit by firefights. Go to click to the south, we'd get hit by firefights. I mean, you had no idea what you were going to get hit by, where, when, and they would actually hit us more when we were in the vehicles instead of on the ground, which was very strange to me. But, um, and then I had, what? what? No idea. Honestly, I, I think that they were more afraid that we could run probably. And that that's one thing that I was thinking about because we didn't really dismount, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we would dismount if we had a metal detector and this and that, but we didn't really dismount when we were in the VIX. Um, if we dismounted, we'd leave the VIX alone, the, the Humvees, um, and we'd leave them alone. Uh, and we'd only leave the gunner and we'd leave um, the driver and that's it into the vehicles if we dismounted. But we also had a mission when going and doing it um <clears throat> so i think that that's a big reason too uh just knowing that if somebody if we heard that explosion hearing this you know they be chasing after them i mean we had no air support too um and i think that was another hard part in afghanistan was we had no air support until three four months into our deployment so I, i'm i'm trying to understand you know when when you watch all that unfold in front of you um and you see the mortar land and your friends essentially disappear um how did you kind of discard that and go to the next day or did it stay with you did it rattle you i mean were you able to compartmentalize it somehow i mean i think uh we took out our anger and we processed it a lot different e each person did right but i think that for instance our squad you know, Cody Boudwin, uh, he was our he was our squad leader, and he knew that if we went to a click to the north, we were getting into a firefight. So, and I mean, this dude was, he loved running. He was so in, in shape. So I remember the next day we got up and he was like, we're going, we're going, just angry. And we booked it. We went to the north and we just sat there just trying to get into a firefight, just to try to do it. 
Um, and it, it's weird because we were angry, but then we start kicking doors in. We started going and busting doors in and taking it out on the civilians almost, right? We almost took it out on the people that it w wasn't responsible for a situation like that. And I think that's where our anger came in. That's where we actually started doing what we had to do almost. <laughs> Any sort of angst towards the leadership or anybody? Because as you mentioned, you, you heard them talking on the radio that you guys were coming. I mean, does, do you feel like you were put in a bad situation by your leadership? No, I, you know, I think uh, we, we had a mission that day and I really can't remember what the hundred percent what the mission was. But I remember we had something and we did have to turn around from that mission. Right. And so we did have to take care of something. So for me, it wasn't about the leadership. I really actually respect a lot of the leadership that we had during that deployment. It was the healthiest that we could. Marcus Hernandez, he's a amazing individual and, you know, he's, he's done some amazing things for all of us. And I think he's, he really put all of us together. He kept us all together as a team, even now at this point too, after deployments and everything else, he's really kept all of us together. Okay. Um, what else on that deployment, you know, if anything still stays with you? I think it was so hard. Just, I think it was going through town, not knowing who we, who the people were, but we were so in such a tight space with so many people coming in. If somebody walked through it, through our patrol, for instance, right. We'd have to take care of them. We'd have to move them out of the way. For me, I think it was also now looking back at it. Our other platoon was in a, in a city called Nowzat, right. And literally if they saw somebody, they'd have to take care of them. And I think for us, it was also a little bit of a, not jealousy, but I want to say like a, wow, why aren't we there to support them almost, right? They had to set up their base. They had to do this. And then also getting the word that people were passing away, doing this, doing that. We lost 21 on that deployment, 20 or 21. And, you know, including an interpreter, so 20 plus an interpreter during that deployment, right? But getting those phone calls and knowing that we were so powerless against helping somebody out. Uh, jumping over and there was one that you know all day firefight that the British hooked us up with when we first got out there um, running through the town and uh, the British actually set our, our our platoon up for instance right so knowing that you're just powerless about against taking care of somebody else at the end of the day I think that was a hard part for that what's it like getting those phone calls what's it like realizing that that guys are dying and you know the 19 year old kid in iraq couldn't really comprehend it does the the 20 year old in afghanistan have a better comprehension of what is happening when those phone calls are placed i think so because i mean now i understand almost why the the phones were shut down almost in a way right they they go off for the 24 hours and now it's starting to get to a point that all right this is almost your processing time you take care of yourself um, mind you, how we worked is no, we're going to go right back on the on the patrol to go find these guys, right? What else? What kind of shit can we get into? What more can we do at this point? So, do you look back on that um, and think you should have done anything different? I don't think. I don't think not only from a combat perspective, but just sort of like from a from a was Denver is self-introspective enough to understand what was going on perspective? You know, I, I think so. I think what I, what I did was the best that I could do personally. Um, mm -hmm. We were there for each other. Um, our squad was really tight. We would sit there and in between patrol, we'd go and play poker and, you know, don't tell the military this, but we'd get some alcohol sent to us in the packages and, you know, don't tell my squad leader that one, uh, okay. you know, just say it. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we, we, we hung out with the British. We, we took care of each other. And I think that was the best part about everything is we, during a hard time, it was okay to tear up real quick, but then we got to keep, keep pushing forward. But then you're also checking up on somebody. And for me, now I'm a, you know, a senior Marine. I got close with the boots. I got close with the guys that literally have never been deployed before because that's their first deployment. Right. So they also integrated a lot of, or, um, a lot of companies too. So we had weapons with us. We had Intel with us. We had everybody with us. You know, we had a cook with us, even though we were eating nothing but MREs, but you know, <laughs> we had a cook with us, for instance. Uh, so I think by Afghanistan, it was also us all just 
dropping everything and just saying, we're going to be together in this. We're going to help each other out for this and we're going to keep pushing forward. All right. Uh, when you get back from that deployment, um, do you know that your Marine Corps career is going to come to an end? 150,000 <laughs> percent. Why? Why? Uh, I was done. Um, I wanted to go back and, and get in some trouble. I wanted to go and do my stupid stuff. And for me, it was two times. I didn't want to be on the third deployment. And then they all got word that they were all going to go on a mute. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, I already chose to get out of the military and I got all sad because Iraq, Afghanistan, and then Mio. Do you know how many people get to do something like that? Not many, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like, really? I already signed the papers to get out, do this, do that. For me, I just wanted to go and have some fun. Take my military that I did, but then now I want to go to school. Now I want to go to college, even though college wasn't for me, you know, but um, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be home. I wanted to be with my family all over again. I wanted to be with my parents and be next to them. I didn't realize how much I missed my family during those deployments. I didn't understand how much I missed my hometown, for instance. Gotcha. <clears throat> um, did anybody try to talk you out of it? No, we were all... I think that was a, a big thing for our, our deployment. I think we had 40 people, you know, out of the 2000 uh, that were, that wanted to actually stay in. But for us, it was, we're done. We're tapped out. If this isn't what a 21, 22 year old kid. I mean, I turned 20 in Iraq and then 21 in Afghanistan, for instance. Right. So that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted, I knew that there was more out there for me. I just didn't know what. And for me, my ideal thought in my head was go to school, get the GI Bill, do this, do that, have everything set up. How does that all start to come to plan once you actually get out of the Marine Corps? <laughs> uh, you know, I when I first got back from Afghanistan, I went on a cruise. Um, you know, I met, met a girl, ended up the day I got out of the Marine Corps, I didn't go back home. I moved to Jersey, actually. Uh, she actually broke up with me the day I got out to Jersey. Uh, nice. so, you know, it is what it is. I was sleeping on the floor, had no money, no nothing. I'm sitting there like, what am I doing? Um, went back to school, criminal justice. But then I also went and did, um, I was working at Longhorn Steakhouse, for instance, as a, as a busser. Um, I was a, a busboy and going from the Marine Corps into a busboy, I actually had a good time. I did it. I was a hard worker. I did what I had to do. And then Buffalo Wild Wings was opening up. But honestly, I had fun working in that serving industry. It was a good time. It was almost that camaraderie that I was missing when I got out of the Marine Corps. Uh, for me, moving to Jersey, it was so scary, not knowing anybody. All I had was my dog at the time and sleeping on a floor. I was like, all right, I can do this, this and that. But uh, Jersey just wasn't for me at that time. So ended up moving back to Santa Barbara and that's when the GI bill started paying you to go to school. Basically. Yep. I, I went to Santa Barbara city college, which I've been to Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful area. Beautiful. It's fun. So for me, I actually had a little bit too much fun, if you will. I had too much fun out there. Um, and that's where I actually found the love of my life. Cocaine, um, you know, just being blunt, just found that love and, that got me in some trouble um, and didn't realize that cocaine was actually leading me down in depression. Uh, for eight months straight, I was doing cocaine every single day, all that good stuff. So yeah. how were you affording it? The GI Bill. Um, the GI Bill was definitely paying everything. Uh, I was renting a bedroom for $600 a month and everything else was literally going to cocaine. It got to a point that I had a girlfriend I was sitting there and we were, she was writing down my loans that I was taking from her, right? It got to a point that every, all my money, I was going negative in my account. I was doing whatever I had to do. I was getting fronts. I was doing everything. And it was just, it was so dumb. It was so stupid. I don't know why um, I was doing it, but it was, it turned into, I have one beer. I was going and getting cocaine. Um, is there any part of you at this point in time that, you know, do you even think like, Hey, I'm sort of so far removed from a Marine. Like I'm, I'm almost disgracing 
my fellow Marines and everything else, or are you just sort of locked into party mode? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack real quick. The way that I found cocaine, right? And for a long time, cocaine was around me in Santa Barbara area, right? However, I kept saying no, 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 because I still had that, that mindset of the Marine Corps. Right. right. It was, I'm not going to smoke weed. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I still had that mindset of like, I'm going to keep my body healthy, blah, 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 all that. Mm-hmm. And then one night, it was Memorial Day, actually. No, no, I'm sorry. It was a, a day that one of our guys passed away. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like drowning. I had people over my ha- at my place and all of a sudden I see the cocaine in front of me. And one of the guys that I knew, he said, looked over at me and he says, you know, it'll get you to talk about it. Right. And I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. He's like, no, I'm serious. If you do this, it's going to get you to start talking about these, these individuals. And I sat there and I was like, all right, cool. I did one. And I mean, I talked all night long. But I recognized and I felt like that was the healthy way to get it out. Right. So for me, that was a big part is that's how I found it. That's how I thought it was going to be healthy. Now, once I started doing it, it got to a point where, wow, I'm not living up to my Marine Corps life anymore. I'm not living up once a Marine, always a Marine kind of thing. I'm not a Marine anymore now. I don't want to talk to anybody that I served with. I don't want to be around anybody that I served with. I don't want to actually engage and actually be a Marine anymore. Right. So for me, it was grabbing all my military stuff, dumping it in the trash, throwing it all all away and being done with it. I was done, you know, and I grabbed my, my uniforms. I threw them all away, unfortunately. And I'll say, you know, and for me, it was, I don't want to be that person anymore. But then I recognized that people were afraid of me. They were like, Why, what is wrong with you? But I didn't recognize that I still had that camaraderie from the military. I still had those friendships. If I found out that you were a veteran, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. Obviously, you wish you'd still had some of your gear left, huh? <laughs> you know, at, at this point, yes. yes. Well, like just memento's sake, right? Uh-huh. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I saved everything. I don't know why. Maybe it's my, my mother's sort of hoarder tendency of saving things in a box everywhere, but. Um, you know, I, I, I got my son, uh, my stepson, he, he's probably going to be going in and literally I will be grabbing his stuff from him. And <laughs> I wish somebody would have grabbed it from me um, and held on to it. Right. Because when you're in that mindset, you're also not thinking hundred percent. You're not, sure. you're just, you, you depression. It can be really real. How did you know that you had gone so f- too far with cocaine? Uh, when I attempted suicide for the first time, when I stood on a bridge and a police officer had to reach over off the suicide bar- barrier and grab me and I punched him in his face, right? Um, that was the first moment that I, uh, now mind you, he wasn't in uniform, so I didn't get charged. Um, but That's I good. think that was the, the first moment that I recognized like, wow, what are you doing? But then that also led me into losing the girlfriend, losing this, losing all the friendships that I had. Uh, This is before like really suicide. This was before anything was really even being talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, it was, how do I talk about this? How do I talk about this with, with my unit? How do I bring this up to the guys that I served with? Because mind you, we got told, don't talk about what you've seen overseas. So what do we do when we're all together? We don't talk about anything from overseas. We don't talk about anything from the Marine Corps. We move past that. When uh, when when that suicide attempt is thwarted, um, where do you go next? I mean, again, you just everybody sort of walked away from you at this point. Yeah, everybody left me. I mean, I, I got dropped off at the VA out in um, in Los Angeles, but. Did the cop take you there or who took you there? So the ambulance actually took me there. I was was strapped to the table, all that good stuff. Nobody even knew that I was even there. Right. So I got out and I went back home to Santa Barbara area. Um, You know, and then I, Oh, I'm sorry. I actually know I went into the, the, there and then they wouldn't let me go. I'm sorry. Yes. They wouldn't let me go back to Santa Barbara. So they actually kept the VA you're talking about. VA. Yes. So in Los Angeles. So that's how I actually got into Los Angeles now at this point. Right. So they wouldn't allow me to go back to Santa Barbara. They actually put me into a rehab. They put me in and said, no, you're addicted to drugs, period. You're not going back. So 
that's when I went into rehab for three months. Uh, a year later, guess what I ended up finding all over again once I started getting my disability from the Marine Corps. <laughs> so, you know, that money didn't really help me out. But uh, yes, I went into rehab for three months. I ended up getting a, a disability, um, went and checked myself into a homeless shelter and uh, ended up getting a disability, for instance, from the VA. And all that money started going towards, uh, I got a, a very, very large sum of back pay, unfortunately. And I say, yeah. unfortunately, um, because as I'm in this homeless shelter for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, right? You, I'm not working. I'm not doing anything. I'm literally going to these groups. I'm going to this. And then they give you a large sum of money. Like there was no budgeting, no nothing. First thing I did was go and buy a truck, for instance. And then I started going to strip clubs and then doing this, doing that. And that's what that disability went towards was stupid stuff. Still don't. I was so ashamed that I was in this homeless shelter at that time. I was ashamed of myself. Why? Why are you allowing yourself to be this person when you're watching and mind you, social media can be one thing, but you're watching social media and you're watching what everybody's still doing, maybe in the Marine Corps, in some people went into the army, for instance. I mean, I don't judge them for that, that wrong decision, but you know, I mean. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you said you met your old friend, uh, Mr. Kane, first name Coke again. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, how, how does that happen? And what happens next? You know, it was, uh, that that's when it, changed my whole life. Honestly, it was, uh, probably for the best, probably for the best, to be honest with you. I attempted suicide for my third time. Um, this time I, I passed away for a couple minutes. Um, you know, I, I stayed up all night. I was going through something. I don't even remember what, but, um, I jumped in my truck, uh, drinking, driving cocaine the next morning at 10 AM or so, you know, I jumped in the truck and I drove. And I was calling my sister. This is when I started reaching out to my two seven guys. I posted a, a mouthful of pills from the VA um, on our social media uh, channel that we had. And I literally just drove. I drove two hours. I was trying to get to my sister's house, but I couldn't make it. Um, pulled up to El Capitan State Beach, jumped out. Luckily, my sister actually had, I didn't realize this until a, a few months ago. My sister actually called a friend of hers, and I thank her friend so much because her friend was a dispatcher for San Barbara County. So I told my sister where I was, but I wasn't telling anybody else. So my sister actually was thankful enough to call and they found out my location. Two surfers actually found me, they called the police, so on and so on. I was laying on the side of my truck. I don't remember any of this. I remember there was some chatter from my, my Bluetooth speaker out of my truck, but that's about it. And I passed out, I was done. Uh, woke up at the hospital, actually, um, Santa Barbara Cottage, Cottage Hospital, and they released me 12 hours later. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I begged them to take me to um, to the psych ward. And once they said no, I manipulated myself out of getting out of that hospital, for instance. I said, all right, cool. I'm out. I'm done. Um, so I went back home. But instead of Instead of going back into old behaviors, once I got home, that's when I actually had people reaching out to me, checking up on me, this and that. Guys had, from the unit or just friends in general? Everybody. Okay. The guys, the civilians didn't understand, right? So the civilians left me alone. These individuals that I thought were my friends literally never talked to me again, even to this day, because of that moment, right? Because of the moments leading up into it. So for me, it was... <clears throat> now I'm on my own. Now I'm doing this. I'm done. So I checked myself back into that homeless shelter, for instance. And two months later, I put in my 30 day notice at my apartment and I checked myself into that homeless shelter and the best decision I could have ever made. I stopped the disability. I could care less about any of that kind of stuff. And that was the moment that I was like, yes, I can do this. <laughs> What, what gave you the, the inspiration or the confidence to be able to just to do it? I mean, you had already fallen off the wagon figuratively and literally once. It was, it was my sister. Okay. My sister said flat out was you can't see your nephew until you go and get the help that you need. Um, and that helped me because my nephews, they're the world to me, all of them. 
Um, they are everything to me. I don't have my own child for my own self, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, my nephews were are everything. Was was there any of you at this point that realized that what you had gone through was directly related to what you were doing? Yes, at that mm-hmm. moment. So yes. yeah, I, I mean, but you were able to actually acknowledge and connect the two because a lot of people still don't. They mm-hmm. they they you know push it off to other reasons and things of that nature. Yeah, no, I I knew it was all me. That was that was all me, and I knew that I had to sit there and, and make a difference. I'm now letting down my family. I'm letting down people I care about. I'm letting down my two seven guys. That's when you asked that question a little bit ago is, did you recognize for your own self? And I was letting down all the two seven guys because we already lost so many guys to suicide, right? Right. The two seven unit, we've lost a lot of guys to suicide already. And so for me, it was, man, I don't want to be 20. I don't want to be 21. I don't want to be 18. I don't want to be another statistic at this point. That day, sitting next to El Capitan on El Capitan Beach on that exit, that was the moment that changed everything for me. It was, I need to get myself back, right? But it wasn't, I also wasn't walking in there to do it for myself a lot of it too, though. I was doing it to regain the relationships that I've had in, in the past almost, right? I was trying to regain my family's trust. That was a big part was losing my family's trust after being a Marine, right? Being a Marine and then your parents sitting there being so proud of you, your sisters being so proud of you. And then you get somebody telling you, I'm not proud of you anymore. I don't trust you. I don't trust you around my family. That's heartbreaking. That's hard to hear. Um, So I was almost doing it, not for myself, but for everybody else around me. With that, you have this renewed sense of confidence and this desire to change your life. Um, there are still steps you have to take to actually do that, you know, find like residence and employment and everything else, you know, all the things that we need to sustain our own lives. So how do you go about that process? You know, it's uh, it's crazy because this is that that home was the change for everything. Two months or a month later, three weeks in or so, I found an organization and Typically, I'm like, veterans? No, no. But I went into that house being a yes man, right? I I went into that house saying yes to anything and everything that I could. I came in that house to get healthy. I came into that house to get off of the drugs, do it on my own. I started going to CA meetings. I started going to meetings with people. I started doing what I had to do. But uh, I actually... Nate Boyer, I was actually on a hike with a couple of the guys from the house um, up at Griffith Park. And then Nate Boyer, Green Beret, played for the Seattle Seahawks, um, came into the house right when I get back. And mind you, a 14 mile hike. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm like, dude, just everybody get away from me. It was an accidental eight mile hike. We were supposed to do four, four miles, but we got lost. So it turned into a 14 mile hike. And mind you, too. Being in a homeless shelter, we couldn't afford an Uber. We couldn't afford any of this stuff. So we had to walk all the way back from Griffith Park, which was a nice little little hike because this that's another thing, too, is the homeless shelter was in Hollywood, too. So um, but I get back to the house and uh, one day I just, you know, saw this dude walking in and there's cameras with them. Um, There's a lot of people that want to be behind cameras. They want to sit there and be like, take my picture. I want to take a picture. I was not that person. I said, you need to get out of my house. I'm going to say this straight up is I'm not a charity case. And please said a lot more vulgar language, but you know, I'm not going to go there right now, but I told Nate, so you got to go, man. You can't take pictures of us, please. You know, ended up finding out the camera guy was a ESPN guy actually. And he was doing a story on Nate Blair. And I just told him, I was like, you got to go, bro. <laughs> like, can't be in here right now. So um, that, that, those words changed my whole entire life to the better because he looked at me and he said, I like you and I'll hear from you soon. And I just looked at him like, dude, you got to go, bro. I didn't know his number. I didn't know who this guy was. I didn't know anything. I didn't know who this guy was, period. I didn't care who this guy was. You got to go. Um 
So that, that right there was a big moment. So what happens next then? I mean, how do you end up following up conversation with him? Yeah, so that evening I found out who Nate was and I almost just slapped my head because walking in that house, I wanted to be somebody different. And I sent him an email. I just said, hey, I'm so sorry. Um, I'd love to sit down with lunch with you. I'd love to do this and pick your brain. I'm looking for a mentor, I told him. That's literally all I said. And Within 20 minutes, he responded back, said, hey, Bubba, no worries. Let's sit down for lunch next week. That's it. And I was so scared to meet up with one person. So uh, I brought a couple other guys with me uh, that following Thursday. And we sat down and Nate Boyer, you hear this? You're a cheapskate because I, you know, $5 or left lunch right there, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, during that time, it was he wasn't working. Nobody was working. We were all like, that was our moment that we were all trying to figure out what was next in life, right? So meeting Nate in that moment, we literally were trying to figure out what's tomorrow. What happens tomorrow? What are we doing tomorrow kind of thing? So Nate came in. He had no idea at that moment uh, what he was doing, but we all sat down. He talked about an idea of a program. They had a name for the program but they didn't know where to find anybody. And uh, it was merging vets and players at that time. So they had one session for merging vets and players. And that was five months prior to that. That's it. Um, So for me, it was, well, I do live at this house with 48 veterans. You know, I can come in with a handful of them and we'll see where it goes from there. And so I assume that he agrees to have a session with you guys. Yeah, so Nate couldn't go in. It was at Jay Glazer, Jay Glazer's gym. And it's it's funny because at that moment, too, I was so tunnel visioned with everything that was going on that right. I didn't even know who Jay Glazer was. I was going to uh, say, for those who don't know, Jay Glazer is a uh, NFL reporter slash analyst slash, you know, exactly. for Fox Sports. So, yeah. And uh, Nate couldn't make it. So I'm, I'm like a yes man at this point. And typically if I don't know somebody, I'm not going to go somewhere. Um, And Nate's talking about this amazing gym in in West Hollywood, unbreakable performance. And he's talking about Jay, like I've known him for years. I'm like, I don't know this guy, man, but you know what? I'll Google him. I'll find out who this. And Jay Jay said, little short egg looking dude. (laughs) You'll see him. I promise you. So, you know, mind you, I'm a homeless veteran walking into this gym that Thursday. And I said, Hey, I'm looking for Jay Glazer. And I don't even know who Jay is, but they send me down and I see Jay and I'm like, Oh, I know who you are. (laughs) Like, what are you doing in this? Um, Randy Couture was there, uh, Sylvester Stallone, so on and so on. And I'm just like, what am I doing walking into this gym? I'm a homeless veteran. Why am I in this place right now? Um, and I go down and before I can even introduce myself, I'm telling Jay my whole entire story. I'm just blurting it all out. Hey, even though I don't even know this guy, he doesn't know me from Cheyenne, but I'm so nervous. And I'm Do you shit. know why you're doing that? I don't know. I really don't. I was so scared that I was like, why are you doing this? You're just and talking to fill the silence. <laughs> I did, that's pretty much what it was. And Jay's so calm. He's in his element. Right. But I'm not in my element and I'm walking out. But I think I, it's that silence almost like, all right, cool. We'll be up with you guys shortly. And it's like, well, let me tell you who I am. You're right. And I'm a Marine Corps. I attempted blah, blah, blah. And he's like, cool. We'll be with you shortly. Just calm, just relax. And it's like, he already knows what we're about to do, but I don't know what we're about to do. I, I'm so scared. I'm like, what am I doing? Right. So uh, we ended up jumping in. We did the MVP session. Eight of us veterans that walked in the door. Randy Couture was there. Jerry Ferraro was there. Um, you know, Turtle off on yep. for instance. And uh, Jeff Schultz was there too. So we had a couple actors, we had a couple fighters, and then we had veterans in there. And I mean, it was it was awkward at first we didn't know what we were doing you know it was just sitting in there and talking um but i had such a great time just because i was a huge fan i was huge this but i also didn't trust 
I didn't trust why this guy wanted us in that in that room, right? So after the session, Jay just said, hey, let's bring in another guys, you know, bring in one other person. And that was the start of MVP. That was the start of merging best players. That was the start of my journey. <laughs> so looking back on that, um, do you think that, you know, something else would have come along? other than MVP? I mean, you seem so determined to put your life on a different path. Maybe it might not have been as fortuitous, but do you, I mean, and I get serendipity and all that, but if it was an MVP, do you think that you would still be lost in looking? You know, I, uh, I was looking for anything at that time because I just wanted to work. I wanted to stay crazy. Right. Um, I did work at telemarketing in between there as well. Um, I was, I mean, I was working at telemarketing where these guys just got out of prison and they just, weren't checking stuff. So I did become like, for instance, the number one salesman within two months at this, this place, which that's almost unheard of. So I already knew what my potential was. I already knew where I can go in life. I know that I am somebody, they wanted to jump me up to a manager within two months of working at this telemarketing. Now, mind you, I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. So I did start looking at serving. I started looking at all these other jobs but they just weren't sticking. I wasn't getting hired. I wasn't doing it. What was the moment where you went from, I don't want to be around other veterans. I don't want to tell people I'm a veteran, veteran ick. I don't, I don't want this to flipping the switch and going, those are the, those are the folks that I, they're still my life, but those are the folks I still need to be around. It was MVP to be honest with you. It was going in there and, and hearing that I'm not alone. I, I had that opportunity to walk in that door and have somebody that you can talk about suicide, you can talk about whatever you want inside that room. And you're not judged because I guarantee you one other person's going to experience the same exact situation, maybe a different light, different way, whatever it might be, but somebody's going to experience it as well. Do you think back to how much you told on that first day or how much you subsequently told people after do you, do you cringe at it a little bit and go, I can't believe I said all that stuff? You know, I didn't really open up until Jay asked a question inside that room, to be honest with you, Mark. Um, I didn't. Jay was pulling us. Like, I'm talking about for the first six months, he was wanting us to just open up and get it out. And we would sit there and just in silence, like, well, I punched a wall this week. I did this this week. I did that this week. And he's like, no, no, I need you guys to talk about this kind of stuff. And Jay actually came back and he asked a question and it was, uh, what are you proud of? And that was the moment that I almost unleashed on Jay because I was so angry with Jay that he asked that question. Why? Why? Because we don't typically stick to the, the proud, right? We don't typically stick to it. We, t we stick to the negative a lot of times, right? So a lot of times we stick there and we're, so quick to jump to a negative situation and this is six years ago mind you from now this is when he he sat there and he just said well i want to know a positive story about what happened overseas so i started no nah, we don't talk about those positives we talk about the negatives jay this that but i think that was the moment that he asked that question and it changed my whole perspective because i did sit back and i at the beginning of this i did say that we got a puck over in iraq for instance um, I talked about the good times playing poker with the guys. I talked about the camaraderie, us joking around. I, I now changed my mindset from the negative that happened overseas into the positive. Now that happened overseas, because typically I don't talk about what has happened overseas. I don't talk about the negative. I talk about now, how can I turn a negative situation into a positive situation just off of what Jay asked that one day? How do you uh, go back and reconcile um, the guy who you were um, and, and the decisions that you made? Um, are you still angry at yourself um, for the habits and the things that you did, or have you learned to forgive yourself? You know, I, I think uh, in the last six years, and I'm going to talk about the last six years real quick with you, right? I think I'm, I think I recognize now at this point what I've done wrong in, for instance, 
the last 10 years, right? Getting out of the military, doing this, doing that. It's been a lot longer than 10 years, but I think I recognize everything. I forgive that person, but I'm still growing to this day. And I stick back and I think about where I'm at within merging bits of players. And I think about the last six years, the growth that I have personally made and the way that I've been able to come back and forgive myself or sit there and say, I'm not that person anymore because I was angry walking in the door. I was upset, but I didn't recognize all that because before the six years, that six years before that, that doesn't define who I am to this day. The growth that I've done within myself, uh, the way that I've forgiven myself, the way that I have screwed up within, you know, being a part of MVP and sitting there and saying, look, it's, it's okay to forgive yourself. You're not that person, but how are we going to grow from those moments too? Are you um, afraid to tell the, or the parts of the deployments and, and the military stuff now still, I mean, you still hesitant to do it or is it all? Easy? No, I I'll, I'll talk about anything now at this point, it's to a point that I feel confident, but I'm also going to look at the positive on it too. Um, I've reached out to um, p- friends, families, for instance, I've reached out to um, moms and stuff like on their birthdays, for instance, I'll reach out to them and just say, Hey, happy birthday, mom. Right. And I'll just say, cause a lot of, individuals are afraid to talk to the families because they don't know what the reaction is going to be. But then you also got to sit back and give them a call and just say, what's up? How are you doing? You know, I'm thinking about you invite them out to lunch if you're in that area. And that's one thing too, is I think now too, is I love meeting up with my two seven guys. Now I love meeting up with my, my veteran buddies. I love it because, you know, we, we get a reunion put together for the two seven guys every year i won't go to the reunion why Why? i want one-on-one connections with everybody right Mm -hmm. i want to meet up with these individuals and talk to them one-on-one or maybe two three guys at a time um linking up with everybody all at once is so difficult because that's where also old behaviors do come into play too right because those reunions can typically come into fun and this and that for me it's I also want to keep my own mindset straight. I want to still stay centered too, for me. What's the, the biggest thing that MVP has taught you um, that you, you pass on to others and other veterans when you have those one-on-one sessions? Oof, I think forgive yourself. Um, knowing that at one point that that doesn't define us but our future is going to define us and who do we want to be at at the end of the day. Right. So if we don't forgive what we've done, what we've experienced, what, I mean, childhood to everything, it, that's what leads us up into a lot of things in life is how do we go pushing forward? And I talk to a lot of people, a national outreach director, and it's, I talk to a lot of members and I think for me, it's how do we, forgive ourselves is there anything uh about your journey that you regret and you'd want to do different no um you know i i think uh i i currently have a girlfriend that i've had since before emerging but players actually and i think for me i think i i've screwed up a couple times where she probably shouldn't be with me right now to be honest with you but she's forgiven me um, and that's the part where I wouldn't be where I'm at without her, to be honest with you. And I got to do that little shout out, right. Is I wouldn't be where I'm at without her, without her love, her patience, her patience has just been incredible. She has watched me going from a homeless shelter to merging vets and players to freaking that movie, for instance, she has watched mm-hmm. this whole journey. Right. And I think so much of her and her son, for instance, her son accepted me into her family, right? I met her son um, when he was nine. Now he's 16 years old, about to get his license. I'm like, whoa. But I I think for me, it's the difference that I would have honestly done is, is forgave myself before I went and snapped at her or got upset with her because I also sat there and told her so many times, you don't understand, right? But yes, I do work in the mental health department. 
And yes, we didn't know how to actually communicate, especially me getting this new job, doing this, doing that, and then getting these phone calls at two, three in the morning, jumping over to somebody's home or whatever it might be, because they just need ever, they need that extra push. They need that extra support. So for me, I think it's uh, her. I think um, I would do a lot of things differently where I would actually explain a lot of what I'm doing to her before I even did it. I think I hid, and so there's a part in it that I hid that I lived in a homeless shelter for six months from her. <laughs> right? You didn't want to come see your place? She wanted to see my place. She wanted to, you know, do everything. But I had an excuse for everything. I had an excuse of why she couldn't see my home, this and that, why I was always at her house because I had my dog. I had everything, right? And I lied to her about working, for instance. <laughs> I told her I was working still. Um, I told her that I had a vehicle, this and that. I was taking the bus to go and see her. She had no idea. And I still don't know how she had no idea to this day. <laughs> I really don't. And I'm curious, but I think that's what I would do is, is I wouldn't lie. Um, I think I wouldn't lie to my family. I wouldn't lie to friends. I wouldn't lie to anybody. And you either like me for who I am or you don't. And you got to accept it now at this point is we all have a past, but forgiving our own self or forgiving others for their past and letting everybody know, man, it's all good. It's okay. We all got something going on. Yeah. So easy to say, so tough to do just to like and forgive yourself. Right. Um, much, much, much easier said than done. Uh, let's yeah. talk about the movie MVP. Now, again, um, it is not officially out yet, but there was a, a, a screening of it done. Now, Nate Boyer, this is sort of his, uh, who is one of the founders of MVP again, his directorial debut here. Um, yeah. This is sort of his baby, but all of it is based on on your story, correct? It, it's it's my story and then uh, another individual's story as well, AJ's story as well. And so last week they put it up on the for the screening for the MVP members. And uh, it was so surreal to see this. And, you know, I, I kept it, Kind of quiet i told a couple of people that this was going to go out nate actually sent me this the script a million times and i said nope 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 he'd get upset because i wasn't reading it right mm -hmm. but i didn't think that this was going to be real i didn't think that something like this story should be out there or needed to be out there um so for me it was more scary than anything but then why, did, why didn't you read it I, it was nerve wracking. One, I didn't know how to re read a script. First of all, I'll tell you that right now. I don't know how to read a damn script, it's especially reading like 10 different people's blinds. I, I, don't I, know thought, I thought you were going to say it's my life. I already know it. What do I have to read it for? That that was another thing. And I, I also <laughs> didn't want to, I didn't want to go back. And if there was something in it too, and, and I've said this is if there was something that Nate wanted in there, I wanted him to have it in there. Right. So if I read it and I'm like, hey, can you please take this out? I don't want to ruin what his thought process was, too. I wanted him to feel comfortable with putting it out without me sitting there and judging it, too, at the same time. I wanted him to feel comfortable and, and have fun doing it without me coming back and saying, bro, why do you have this in there, man? Like, come on. So I think that was a big part for me is I wanted to actually make sure that it was him too putting it in there. When you watched it, uh, what was your initial reaction? Um, you know, I, I walked in about 10 minutes late to the film. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I needed a breather before I went in and, and saw it. Right. So I did walk in about 10 minutes late and then I sit down and I just see Zaffer up on the screen and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is real. But then I also didn't really tell many people. But after the, that screening, I had everybody, especially the members, the MVP members, just coming up and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was like, I didn't do anything. I didn't do the acting. I didn't write the story. I didn't do anything. But it was, it was humbling almost. It was like, all right, this is real. This is going to happen. And cool. Thank you, Nate. Right. So thank you for telling the story because I think it needs to be out there. I think a lot of individuals can take it and I think the biggest part was seeing the beach moment laying down and I think that was one of the hardest parts um I watched a lot of these MVP members and they were almost shell-shocked 
that this was out there because me, I tell my story everywhere. Why? Because I think that it can help a lot of individuals out. I think if you're going through a hard time, we, we do have to talk about it. We have to let it out. So I think this is going to help out the MVP, the veterans, the athletes. And I love the fact that it is focused a lot on the athletes too, because just now the athlete side of things is just now starting to come out. The right. mental health awareness is now 2009 for the veteran side of things. And I think that's a big part about what's going to happen with this. Go back to um, the bridge where that off-duty cop pulled you off. <laughs> if, if you could be that off-duty cop, uh, what would you have said to yourself at that point in time to maybe set yourself straight? I don't think there would be anything, to be honest. Uh, I wasn't hearing. I really can't even tell you what that guy was even saying to me. I can't tell you anything, right? Um, all I remember is a hand coming down, grabbing me. And but, No, but like if you go, you go be that cop. What would Denver Morris now, if he was pulling somebody off that bridge, say to a Denver Morris who wanted to jump off that bridge? You know, if I, I've done quite a bit of these now, too, afterwards. And I, I go and I sit there and I relate with somebody now. It's, it's also, I understand I'm there. How, what are we going to do together now? What, you know, I, that, that's one thing that I, I wish. And I, I work with a lot of the cops nowadays and I work with a lot of them and, and I wish that the cops could walk those journeys with a lot of these individuals, right? I wish that cop could walk his journey with me at the end of the day. I wish he could be there to watch what I become, watch that. For me, it's, I get it. I get to do that now with a lot of these in, these members, a lot of these veterans, these combat veterans and these former athletes, I get to do the walk with them. Um, but I think for me, I would have just said, I'm there with you. I'm walking with you. I got you. I'm here by your side. What do you, uh, what do you hope for yourself with MVP going forward? You know, I, I, I am, learning to be patient for myself um i'm being patient on where everything's going what i hope for is the organization to be continuing to be successful opening up more chapters and helping a lot more individuals the journey for myself it's not over yet i know that there's a lot of growth for me and i can't tell you what the next six months going to hold because you know I've learned that I just got to go day by day at this point right now, especially working in this realm is I got to do day by day. And that's what I hope that I can continue to grow as an individual and I can continue to inspire and help other people out. Any chance that uh, the old Denver Morris would ever show back up? Like, how do you know how to keep that guy away? No, I, I laugh about it because I do think about it because I do experience loss. I do experience those, those moments that brought me into that old behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. And I really don't see it. I, I pull myself out of situations that I don't need to be in nowadays. I bring it out and I walk away from a bad situation. I might be around. Um, I think for me, it's, I've grown so much that I have such an extensive team that locker room all over again i am so too honest almost inside of those rooms with mvp i i talk about anything and everything it's almost scary right. what i talk about and i think i don't see myself going into it because i don't allow myself to go into it nowadays would the guys from 27 be proud of you now absolutely i know that they would be i've, I've had a lot of 27 guys come into mvp now um, and now they're starting to understand. I think the first uh, segment, I did an interview for Fox Sports and they were angry with me. They were mad that I, I talked about 2-7 on there. And now I'm getting people saying, thank you for telling our story now, because that was the first time publicly that story was being put out there. It was hard to talk about the suicides. It was, talk, it was hard to talk about the deployments. But for me now, it's, I'm getting people saying, thank you for what you're doing. I'm getting the two seven guys saying, how can I start a new nonprofit for our, myself? I'm getting two seven guys hitting me up about anything and everything. Now, when there's a welfare check or something, a lot of times I'm getting that phone call. I'm getting people hitting me up and they're now saying, thank you. 
thank you instead of being angry with me six years ago. I mean, it's an incredible journey. Um, you know, and one that uh, I, I've sort of for the latter part of it here in the last year plus, I've I've been able to sit sidecar for, or at least you know, uh, learn a little bit more about it. Um, what What do you think is your biggest impact every day? Every day, the connection that I can have with somebody. Um, I think uh, that's that's the biggest impact is somebody can call me and they know that I'm going to answer. They know that I am going to 100% answer. If I can't answer that day, that time, that minute, I will call them back or I will let them know, hey, I got your phone call. Is everything okay? And I will get back to you, I promise you. And I think that's one of the big impacts that I have is even if they're happy, if they're mad, they're checking in, whatever it might be, I'm going to always call back with them really fast. And I think that's an impact that I hope that everybody starts having as well as is being there for somebody. I said this a long time ago, and it's before somebody gets with me and asks me about work, about this or that, I'm going to always ask somebody, how are you doing? And I always say just like that. No, 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 Mark. How are you doing today, man? Like, talk to me. Let me know. We, you brought it up in the very beginning. We become friends, and that's what we do is – but sometimes if we got to talk about work, if we got to talk about this, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to check up on you before anything, because you never know what somebody's holding on to. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to give you a, a quick moment. Um, and again, you can go to vetsandplayers.org uh, anywhere across America and sign up. If you don't have an actual physical MVP chapter in your area where you are we still hold virtual sessions as well that you can take part in and and, uh and sort of get the connection and uh and and therapy that you need and uh, you know i tell everybody it's great it's a peer the peer-to-peer thing is just it's it's so easy and simple but it's what separates i think um mvp from other other places you know you're not on a couch in a in a sterile office you're not uh having somebody with degrees on the wall sit here and talk to you You're, you're talking to a peer um, and, and they are completely understanding you. It's kind of like a best friend who you didn't even know was your best friend. Oh, yeah. um, so it, it, it's certainly unique, but again, vets and players dot work. Um, you know, and, and I, I wanted to give you a chance because, uh, MVP just did, uh, sustain a big loss, um, in, in the community, uh, in the MVP community with, with the passing of Tim Lane. Um, you know, you knew him better than I did, but I, I wanted to give it, you know, allow you a minute or two just to speak on Tim and what he meant to, to MVP and, and everybody who was part of it. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that. Um, you know, Tim, known him for about six years now. Tim was a world kickboxing champion over in the Vegas chapter. Um, myself, I, I wasn't, didn't have the opportunity to be in the Vegas chapter, but I got to do a lot of trainings with him. So uh, one of the big parts where we got connected was during MVP training, um, where it was only the Los Angeles and Vegas chapter. Uh, this was six years ago and Tim came out biggest smile on his face every time. Right. Um, and Tim's very responsible for a lot of the training that we do within the organization. Um, we sat down and we spent hours going over the training model, um, for MVP. So every time that somebody does a training, they know that Tim Lane's a part of that training, the 30 minutes, you know, the switching back from the workout, this and that. So, um, Tim had a huge impact on everybody Uh, the last week or so. We've been getting a lot of phone calls on what Tim meant to them. And for me, that's also who I want to be. That's who we should all look up to. And I think there's one thing that I've been hearing is over and over is when you talk to Tim, he doesn't cut you off and he looks you in the eyes every time. And you don't know if the conversation's over because he's still looking at you in the eyes. Um, I think that right there is a quality that all of us should be holding on to. Tim, friend, mentor, uh, MVP member, kickboxing champion, and a friend, a big friend to everybody. So uh, we definitely, you know, as an organization, it hurts. However, we're going to keep pushing forward and we are going to keep hope alive. Well, again, you guys can uh, can contact Denver, uh, dmorris at vetsandplayers.org if any of you out there um, you know, feel like you need to have your story heard, uh, and Denver will be absolutely there to, to listen. Uh, if you're ever in that, that place where you don't know who to turn to, Denver is the guy to turn to because he's uh, seen a lot and done a lot. And certainly uh, I can't personally thank you enough for everything that you have done 
um, for me, uh, and it, just our professional and personal relationship has just continued to grow. You know, I look at you like a brother. And like I said in the beginning, we didn't serve in combat together, but I love the service that we're doing now side by side. And, you know, I mean, I, it's it's guys like you and people like you that why, you know, I'm still here with MVP and I'm still doing it uh, because it's it's not letting guys like you down. Right. Um, you've put so much of your heart and your soul into this whole entire thing, um, you know, and, and uh, as people know, even though I'm the colonel, man, I follow you anywhere. You know, like you're, you're, you're the boss in that sense. You know, I, you're, you're the leader and, and you've set such a great example for so many of us to follow, brother. It's just uh, it's been great to be to be side by side with you through this whole thing. I appreciate it, brother. Honestly, it's it's a work in progress. All of us are. And just like you, I can learn a lot from you, man, especially towards the leadership side of things. So I'm excited to continue to grow with you, with everybody, anybody that hears this. Like you said, reach out to me. I'm so down for it. It's been a pleasure, brother, as always. I know we'll talk again, but Denver Morris, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thank you, brother. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.